We're going to talk about uh, testing, charging, replacing batteries. Is that a hard subject? No, it's a pretty easy subject. Replace batteries. Uh, is batteries a simple thing? Yes. Let me tell you, batteries are nothing but simple now because the technology has changed them. Same with the charging systems. Everything is complicated because of electronics, but not too complicated that you guys are the smart ones, so you'll handle this okay. <laughs> now, um, the most important part of any vehicle is its battery, its electrical system. Without a good electrical system, without a good battery, there's all sorts of issues that can go on, okay? And yet, it seems to be the one part of the car that most technicians tend to put last and forget to check. Let me tell you, that one of the first things we do when we diagnose a car problem should be the battery. It should be the battery. When we service the car, we should be not neglecting the battery. If we can have a battery that appears to be okay, the car's still starting okay, lights are coming on, but it can be low in voltage, and we don't know about it if we haven't tested it. Sometimes we can have a misfire in the car. Sometimes we can have um, hesitation in the car. There's all sorts of issues we can have electrically, with um, you know, clusters playing up. All these things can play up because of a battery. <coughs> so I want you to realise batteries are not that, a very, a very much an integral part of the car that needs to be considered with the overall condition of the car. Abby, no girl looking at the moment. Well, oh, look at me. <laughs> I'm the pretty one today. <laughs> all right. So we'll start. You might think you know everything, there's always something you don't know, and that's what I think will happen today, you'll learn something. Yes, sir. Again, do I need to go over PPE? I guess I do, because batteries are a risk, okay? They're a risk because there's um, a lot of hydrogen that's developed when the batteries are charging, that's coming out as fumes. What's hydrogen? Is it an inflammable gas? Yes, yes. It is. It's a vapour and it would explode if we had a spark thing. So we do need to be a bit mindful of that. What happens if my wedding ring that I don't wear, I'm not married by the way, look. I lost my ring when I was um, in um, Morton Island and it was quite cold and it just went right to the ground in the ocean. It was intentional. Never to be found again. Intentional. <laughs> just don't tell the wife. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, if we've got a ring on and we actually accidentally touch something that's got voltage, like a 12 volts or something, and our ring is touching a ground, what's going to happen? Spike. We're going to get a very hot finger. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> very hot. <laughs> current will fly through that. And what happens when current flows and it's going directly to um, back to the battery? <laughs> it's going to get hot, okay? Yeah, Which way does current flow, by the way? Does it flow? Tell me this. Does it flow from the positive to the negative of the battery, do you think? Yeah, positive to negative. You yeah. think that? Anyone, yeah, any, anyone beg to differ? Negative to positive. Everyone can agree? Yeah, from positive, what can I say is right, but I think. Positive to negative? Positive to negative. How sure are you? 85%. 85. <laughs> Do I get 100 from anyone? 100. 100? I'm about to blow your bubble because it's the other way around. Yeah. Okay. Theor theoretically, they thought that that's the way the electrons flow. But we now know that they don't. They flow from ground back to the positive, not the other way around. But because all our textbooks were written, we often say it goes positive to negative, yeah. but it doesn't, okay? It doesn't. It, it actually goes the other way. So one, this is something... One example is the electricity from the households we have. That's AC electricity. It's going backwards and forwards. Ah. It's not just going in one direction. It's going in all directions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it can bite. It can hold on to you. <laughs> um, we can get a shock in a car. We can get an electric shock. There are some um, high voltage... Um, components to a car, even a non-electric car, like electric cars are very high voltage and very dangerous if we're not careful. What sort of things can happen with a, um, where can we get high voltage from in the car? Any idea? Alternator. Not really. Uh, initial leads. 
Yes, you electric. I've noticed only charging 12 volts, it's regulated. Um, yes, there's a rectifier that rectifies it from AC to DC. I guess without the rectifier, not rectifier, the without, sorry, without the regulator, it will go higher, but it won't go extreme, extremely high. Oh, okay. But a coil, a ignition mm -hmm. coil, does produce thousands upon thousands of volts, okay? Maybe somewhere between 6,000 to maybe 20,000 um, lots of volts. That's a lot of voltage. Mm -hmm. That can hurt. Has anyone had a kick from a spark ignition system? Yes. You yes. have? Yeah. yeah. Not nice, is it? Um, I used to, as a kid, we had an electric fence at home where the horses used to be, and I got all my kids to hang on to that electric fence and hold hands, and the last one got a zap. <laughs> um, I was a mean dad, wasn't I? <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't do that with an uh, ignition system. An uh, electric fence is quite a low voltage compared to that. But you know, it's not the high voltage that kills us. It's not the high voltage. High current. It's the current. Mm. It's the current that kills us. I forget the... Um, I didn't know what, how much it was. It wasn't that high either, the current. But a certain amount of current will um, stop our heart. Can you hold it to me? Sorry? Oh, it's so a bit warm in here. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Fiji weather. <laughs> Maybe we can crank it up in a minute. Just yeah. Um, so anyhow, I'm just bringing all this together to say that, yeah, we do have to be careful when dealing with batteries and um, ignition circuits and systems, right? Also, just before I forget, some of these um, headlights now, the high-definition headlights, the ones that um, uh, uh, they got transformers in them, mm. they also hold a lot of voltage. You can get a damn awful um, shock from <coughs> one of those. So be careful. Often, when we even um, let it sit for a while, the capacitors hold and retain a little bit of the voltage too. So we'll just be careful. Okay. Yes, sir. So anyhow, I think most of that we've covered in the past. But just three line batteries are something that we have to be careful of. Okay. We need to prevent battery spills, aren't we? Um, a small spill. Um, we don't want to go into the water course. A small spill on the floor we can deal with. But a massive spill we can't deal with, that's quite dangerous because the fumes are a health risk. Um, they give off this strong smell, the battery acid. What sort of acids in a battery, by the way? Sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid. I hope I'm right. Yeah, you are right. I am right. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. I didn't prepare today. I'm pretty sure I know myself, but I just have to be sure. But have you ever smelled sulfuric acid? Yes. It's a strong smell. Mm. So if we have a big spell on the right on the um, ground and workplace, we'd want to be downwind, not upwind, to catch all that fumes. It could be very bad for our health. Um, so when we deal with the spill, we immediately put sand over it. So they say. I don't know. If, uh, kitty litter or whatever we use or sawdust might not might not pay. I don't know. If you had nothing else, I don't know. Soil. Uh, but but that, they reckon sand. Oh, that's okay. what I heard. Well, that's what my notes tell me. I don't know. Um, I don't read it. I'm just reading my notes. Okay. Um, we need to dispose of our um, waste, don't we? We've got our, we've got our battery um, um, when we come to the end of life of that battery. We need to be containing that in an area that can be containing any spills, right? Sometimes those battery cases are cracked and they can leak. So we want to be careful that we have some area that's just dedicated for battery, old batteries, that we collect ready to be what? To go into the general waste? No, recycle. Recycle, good. One of the, um, who was it? If you're hearing me, if you're here, and it could be one of you, one of you in your assessment on the other day for environmental suggested that we use sweep up the floor correctly and put the floor sweepings, right, in the general waste bin, correct? And then that goes to be recycled. Everything in the general waste bin, where's it go? No, it goes in, in, in landfill, doesn't it? Yeah. So it's someone question six. If you're here, you're hearing me now, you got that question wrong. Twice you got it wrong. So yeah, you need to get it right. <coughs> so that's all right. I have a feeling you might misunderstood must may have misunderstood something because I think everyone knows that um, general waste goes in the landfill. I don't know. All right. Um, 
So we need to be careful that we dispose of things right. We also need to be looking at our, what's an SDS? We talked about that, haven't we? Safety data sheet. Sa safety, safety, data safety data sheet. sheet. What's a safety data sheet tell us? Uh, does, does it tell us how we deal with under, the end of the life yeah. of a product? Does it tell us how we handle the product? Yes. yes. Does, safety. It, does it tell us um, our first aid if we do have a problem? Yes. So all that information is in our SDS, safety data sheets. Okay. Where do we find our safety data sheets? Office or even in the product. Okay. Yeah. Where it's easy accessible and every Internet. workshop. Online. Every Every workshop will have their own system. Well, they should do. I know they don't, but they should do. So it should be where it's easy accessible for all staff to get to. And yes, it can be online as well, okay? All right. So when we're handling and storing batteries in the workshop, we have a procedure to follow, don't we? And we want to follow that procedure. So if an accident or a spillage occurs, again, we look up our SDSs. We just talked about that. Um, all workshops <coughs> should have the SDSs on batteries and battery acids available for the staff. And also, battery specifications can be found online um, in some of the parts departments. We have a battery, we used to buy, um, what was it, um, I can't remember now, bought them for a long time, but they were online. Um, it, it, we used to buy um, um, X-Lite batteries, but I can't think of the batteries we bought, but they were a good battery that we used to buy, and they had a very good online presence that told us dimensions, the capacity of the battery, um, the, the size, the terminals, the terminals can be back to front on some batteries that we have to be careful of. So it's important we get the right battery. And this online um, service that my battery supplier had, we'd be able to put the vehicle in and it would tell me which is the right battery, okay, to get for that vehicle. So yeah, there's all that information available now. It makes it easy for us. Somebody I know put the wrong battery in a Mercedes once, okay. That Mercedes started um, shutting down on computers because it was the wrong battery. And that car cost that um, workshop <coughs> enormous amounts of money because of damage caused by putting the wrong battery in. Don't want to put the wrong battery in the car, all right? The wrong battery you mean by size or by No, brand? by um, resistance capacity, the, all the, the amp hour, yeah. I don't know. All that, plus more. Uh, it was probably an AGM battery. And AGM batteries, you know, a little bit different, not a lot, but they are different. But look, uh, it's important to look up the right specifications, okay? Can't drum that in. Yes, you get away with it, with 90% of the cars, but maybe if you put the wrong battery, it's not going to matter. But 10% will matter, okay? It might be more now because new cars are coming out all the time, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the old school battery, the ones that we at Malls probably see now in our workshop, are what we call um, lead acid batteries. They're all, most of them are lead acid batteries, just the lead is not always what's called a, um, what do we call them, um, a fluid battery. There's a name for a fluid battery, it might be on here. It's not there, but anyhow. Um, but this battery, they have plates, okay, they have plates. And they have cells. Each cell is made up of X amount of plates. There's probably seven plates, some batteries nine plates. It could be 12 plates, I don't know. But these plates are separated and are separated by insulation. But we have what's called a positive plate and a negative plate. Positive plate, negative plate. So that they've got these different plates. And I used to know the name of these plates um, uh, it's not coming to me. That's all right. I'm getting old, guys. I'm 67, so I forget things it's much easier than I used to. <laughs> okay. okay. So they, these plates, right, the electrons will flow if there's an electrolyte. An electrolyte is a means for those electrons to flow through. And what most electrons, electrolytes were, were sulfuric acid and demineralized water. That's in a, um, a wet might be a wet battery I'm thinking of. I'm, there's a name for um, lead acid batteries that have um, acid in it. I can't... Just gel battery. battery? Not gel battery, oh. no, no. But anyhow, they come to me what I'm thinking about. But these, these wet cell batteries, right? Wet cell batteries have acid in them. If you tip them up, the acid will leak out. If they overcharge, 
the um, fumes will come out, the um, hydrogen will come out and you'll smell it. Um, but these wet batteries with the acid in it or the electrolyte in it, it's a means of transferring electrons from the, which way does it go? Negative to positive, right? So it lets it flow through the cells. Each of those cells, each of those cells which are made up of plates, represent 2.2 or 2.1. I think it's 2.2, it is. 2.2 volts. So there's usually six lots of cells in a battery, in a 12 volt battery in here. So mm. six lots of 2.2s um, is equal what? What? 12.6. voltage is what you expect on a good battery to see. Most batteries will have what's called a surface charge on them, which means they'll be a little bit more than 12.6, so probably 12.7, 12.8. But when that sur surface charge drops off, what I mean by surface charge is they've been charged by the alternator all the time. So when you go and check it, if you just turn the engine off, it's probably going to, even though the alternator is no longer charging, you'll probably find that it's going to be about 12.8 volts. All right? Uh, if it's below 12.6, I get concerned. Okay, it shouldn't really be below. It might just be that it's um, lights have been left on, the ignition has been left on, something's happened and it's dropped down a little bit. But it also could be a telltale sign. If it was down to 12.4 volts, I'd start to think there's something wrong with that battery. If it was down to 12 volts, I'd be really concerned that that battery was playing up. I'd probably charge it with a normal charger to start with to bring up the voltage again. But I'd want to see those voltages stay up around the 12.6 to 12.8 volts, okay, to know that it's okay. But each of those cells will be transferring when there's a load. There always has to be a load for current to flow, okay? So we have to turn something on. When we turn the ignition on, we've got current flow. When we've got current flow, we've got electron flow. The electron flows are then flowing from the positive cells to the negative cells through each of those plates, through each of those cells. Those cells are joined together. Each of those cells are joined together. They're joined together in a what we call in series. Do we know what we're talking about when I say series? No. No? No. No. Okay. We can have a circuit wired up parallel or we can have a circuit wired up series, okay? I should have my whiteboard to draw, but it's too hard to get to. That's a whiteboard. I know, it's too hard to get to. But if we join a positive terminal to a positive terminal, if we join a negative terminal to a negative terminal, we wire that in parallel. Okay? If we join a positive terminal to a negative terminal, and the same on the other terminal, negative to a positive terminal, that's in series. If we join something together in series, we're multiplying each of the, or we're adding together each of those cells. 2.2 yeah. .2 volts, 4.4 volts, 6.6 volts, until we get up to 12.6 volts, okay? We join them in series, we multiply, not multiply, we add together all those voltages. When we join them together in parallel, we don't change the voltage at all. The voltage stays the same, okay? We do increase the amps that, that that battery can do by joining them in parallel. Sometimes we'll join batteries in series to get a higher voltage, maybe in a truck for 24 volts. But we might have four batteries and two of them are in parallel, joined together with the negative to the negative and power to the power, which is um, positive to positive, I should say, which is parallel. But then we have the other two terminals going from negative to positive and positive to negative in series. So that way we get 12 volts, not 12 volts, we get 24 volts, plus we doubled up the amp rating of that battery by having them in parallel, okay? Mm -hmm. So yeah, all right, so the chemistry of the battery of a wet cell battery, I'm pretty sure that's the name, wet cell battery, yeah. The wet cell battery is that it's made up of um, plates and the number of plates determines the size of the battery. Um, the capacity of the battery, how much amp hours that battery will have, and we'll talk about amp hours and things later. Some batteries that have got 12 plates will be probably have a much higher amp rating than someone that's only got seven plates, in other words. That are all, I say 12 plates, I always thought they were uneven numbers, they have to be uneven numbers, so maybe it was 13 plates, I can't, I don't think that would be even, sorry, because we always have to have one negative, one extra negative one, or positive one to make the uh, electrons fly from memory. 
Bermia. That's roughly what the batteries consisted of, so we'll move forward. Okay, we also have gel filled batteries. What's a gel filled battery? What's a gel? I haven't got any gel in my hair today, but it's not that type of gel. But the acid is a liquid, okay? They use a paste, type of a paste, that suspends the acid in that paste. That's an acid paste. And therefore, that battery doesn't have the same um, characteristics as a wet cell battery. A gel cell battery then doesn't have the... I didn't talk about getting a battery hot either, by the way. If we overcharge a battery too much, too quickly, put too many amps in the battery, we cause a lot of heat because we have a lot of current flow. It's not good for a battery. But as we do that, we also burn off. We burn off the... Um, uh, water, because we put some demineralized water in to mix with the acid in the battery. We burn that off, okay. Uh, but with a wet cell uh, gel battery, the gel doesn't tend to have that same characteristic. There's still a vent in the battery. We don't have any caps. So like in the old days, we used to have caps on our battery to fill up the cells, wet cell battery. With a gel cell, we don't have those caps. It's virtually a maintenance-free battery. And it's been maintenance free because we don't get the um, burning off of the or the evaporation of the distilled water like we did in the wet cell battery because it's all a paste. And so they're more uh, robust, they don't um, corrode as much. You know, we see lots of corrosion on battery terminals. We'll often find less of that on a, a gel battery, okay? Um, so it's similar to a lead acid battery, but it uses a gel instead of a liquid. From their outward appearance, there's no difference. They wouldn't, you wouldn't know the difference by looking at them. Um, they can be mounted on the side. We can have the terminals on the side because there's no acid that's going to fall out of them. And um, they perform at a higher altitude. So altitudes can play up, I guess, with a battery because the colder the weather and the higher the altitude, the, altitude, the less the, bat, um, the current will flow, They're not as well anyhow. Okay, and uh, ideal for aircrafts. Who works on aircrafts? I'm glad no one here works on aircrafts because I don't think I want to hop in your airplane. Okay. We have calcium batteries. Okay, calcium is another chemical. Uh, are also similar to lead acid batteries, but the calcium added to the grid plates, that will give it more strength, apparently. It, it strengthens the battery. It allows for a higher temperature without the plates getting damaged. The battery lasts longer. Resistance to corrosion is more, uh, less, and uh, less gassier. Gas is when the, as I say, when the battery is charging, you get that hydrogen and, and all that fumes coming in, vapors coming out. So calcium batteries are going to be a bit more expensive. Then we come on to AGM batteries. Have you ever heard of AGM batteries? AGM. No. AGM? Okay. AGM batteries stand for absorbed glass meth. Does that make sense? Meth. Um, huh? Meth. Yes. Glass. Do we have glass in the battery? Do you think that's what we're talking about? Yes. Sir. yes. I think glass would break. It might break. I don't think it would be glass. glass. But what, what it is, it's like a fiberglass, okay? And that's why it's called glass. And it's like a mat. It's a mat. And look at this, it's all, instead of having all these plates, they're round in circles. So, and they'll be insulated. It's like a plate. But yeah, it's pretty smart technology. And AGM batteries have been around for a while. They have been. But they're very good for people who go camping, have a solar panel, and they want to recharge their battery because these batteries... They get down to about 50%, yes, and you need to keep them charged up, don't get me wrong, but they have, um, they're much more able to handle you know, differences of voltages where they drop down and they get charged up again. But you do have to be careful how you charge those batteries up. If you overcharge them or put too much charge in them, or if you don't put enough charge in them, they will prematurely fail you. So you do have to have the right battery charger for them. You also have to have the right battery testing equipment for them, a little bit different to it cell batteries but yeah but that they are pretty good a lot of cars are going for those batteries now a lot of european cars have got agm batteries particularly yeah mercedes and uh, bmws and things so lithium lithium ion batteries 
all our electric cars, all our hybrid cars, all those cars are using lithium. All our, my, tel- my phone here, it's got lithium in it. A lot of things have lithium batteries in it, okay? And um, so lithium, it has many different uh, chemistries. Uh, they use extensively in the hybrid electric vehicles. A new battery technology and is still being developed. Obviously, our electric car manufacturers are trying to make them smaller, trying to make them last longer. They can get more kilometres out of them. So we're still evolving in, in this area. So we've got lithium iron phosphate, got lithium iron um, ferro, uh, ferro fate, fate? <laughs> I can't even say. Um, but, but all these different types, so I won't go and bore you with them all, but the, the technology is developing and changing. I, I do wonder though um, where we'll go next, because I reckon we will go somewhere else, because lithium battery our, is a very um, uh, uh, li- limited resources of lithium that's available in our mine, in, our, um, in the world, and lithium is a very valuable source, a resource that we're looking for now. So I don't know how long we'll stay with lithium, but at the moment that's where we are. And um, they have a much longer uh, life cycle and they're more tolerant to <coughs> the use. But they also, have, they also have to have a, um, monitor, a battery monitoring system as part of a, a lithium battery to maintain those batteries. So you have electronics to go with that battery, whereas, say, the AGM battery or the lead acid batteries, you don't need that. So. And you have to have all these different types of terminals. The most common one being these ones. But yeah, we've, I've seen those ones. There's different types of battery terminals. Okay, I talked to you before about series and parallel. So we've got an example here. Who can tell me what this is? Oh yeah, what's that one? The parallel series. <coughs> parallel. Parallel. Is that parallel? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good. Good answer. What about this one? Series. 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 Good answer. So look what happens. Two six volt batteries in parallel, still six volt. Okay, very important to remember that. It could be 12 volt, it could be 24 volt, but whatever the voltage in parallel, we're not multiplying. But what are we multiplying? We're multiplying, look, our, um, the, the amount of amps that that battery has to, to deliver. Okay? But look here, we're in series. What happened to our amps? It stayed the same. Same. Didn't it? So, yeah. So, something to think about. All right. Here's a whole bank of batteries. So, what have we got here? That battery is connected to that battery, and that battery, what's that in? Parallel. It's parallel, isn't it? Yeah. This one's parallel, yeah. mm-hmm. but these ones, what are they? Yeah. They're in series. So, see what they've done? They've mixed up the parallel and series to get um, more yes. amps, but also more voltage, okay? So that would be called a parallel series um, circuit, okay? The way they've hooked that up, parallel ser- in series. Yeah, Maurice? Um, yes. We usually use the series with, for the cars, right? We series the battery from another battery in order for... If, if we use a jump start battery, yeah. okay, we're actually parallel. Yeah, not, oh, okay. not, not not series. Um, so I, I don't believe in cars we do put batteries in series, mm-hmm. but in trucks we could. In trucks oh, we could. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. What's CCA? Sorry? CCA. CCA, cold crank amps. We're going to come to that soon, okay? All right. Ah, look at that. Let's just mention it. Here we come. So, Cold crank amps is a, a way of measuring the battery. And we use that a lot for here in Australia. And you know, it's the ability for the battery to deliver the maximum amps in a time frame without the cell voltage going below 1.2. Remember I said the cells are 2.2 volts? So it might drop a voltage, but no more, okay? So once it gets to that one volt drop, voltage drop, then that's how long it took how many seconds it took for that battery to get down there so we expect it to be 30 seconds or or however long okay and each manufacturer has a different rating for their batteries the cold crank amp rating and it's done on a hot day is that right a hot battery yes 
No, it's done on a cold battery. Good. So when it's cold, there's a certain temperature. I can't I remember. It might be minus Where 20 degrees. I don't know, but it's a certain temperature that the factory or the manufacturer will have to do that cold crank air test. And it has to last 30 seconds and not go below 1.1 volt, which if we add them all together is how many volts? Six um, cells, that's six point, uh, six point six volts. Yes. Okay, so the whole battery would have to stay at 6.6 .6 at that, that, in those conditions. What's air powers? It's another terminology to measure a battery. We don't, we, we talk about a 250 amp hour battery. What is that? That means that the battery has the ability to deliver power over a period of time until the battery reaches 10.5 volts. Okay? So it, it determines how many, um, so if it's a um, 20 hours period, so that's a fairly long period they've said there, but it's got to last. So if it lasts 20 hours, what's, what amperage will that battery be? How many amps, amp hours would it be? It'd be 20 amp hour, wouldn't it? <coughs> Does that make sense? No. Who, you tell me. <laughs> So, if the battery can deliver power over a 20-hour period until the battery reaches 10.5, yeah. okay, every hour, okay, it's lasted 20 hours to get to 10.5. So it's a time period. Yes. How long can the battery last before it gives up? Okay. 20 hours. 20 hours or 20 amp hours. 20 amp hours. 20 amp hours. Yes. Yes. Okay, most of the batteries are talking about 150 amp hour or, or, or more, okay, or 100. Testing batteries. We have to be always mindful, as I said, with batteries to wear our PPE so we don't get acid on ourselves or um, get having our rings left on us, we want to take them off. Um, so once we've done all that, um, we have to understand the type of battery that we're testing, okay? Not every battery can be tested the same. We have to determine um, positive and negative terminals. Who knows um, if you can't see a negative or a positive on it, that there is another way of telling which is negative and positive on a battery. Who knows how that is? Color. Sorry? Color. Color, yes. Size. Size, yes. So there's a few ways we determine. So the small terminal, is that a positive terminal? Negative. Good. Oh. So you know your stuff. Good. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we need to do that. We need to check with the manufacturers the procedures to prevent any damage or injury. So see what we're dealing with. If it's a um, AGM battery, we will have a different technique than if it's an acid battery. So that's why we need to check. Uh, we need to do a visual look. To check. We always talk about visuals, aren't we? We need to check that the, the battery doesn't have any signs of cracks in it. Leaks. We have to check that the battery is secure. What about the battery terminals? Are they important to check? Yes. yes. Are they going to be tight or loose? Tight. Tight, tight. definitely, definitely. If we have a loose battery terminal, is that going to cause us problems with our starting? Yes. It will, because what will happen? Voltage drop. We'll, we'll get a voltage drop, exactly. Okay. Yeah. If we get a voltage drop, yeah. it can't perform as well as it should, okay? Um, Battery behaving system for it. Yeah. We're talking about fluid level, but I don't think there's a car on the road today that's got caps that you remove. There could be, but there's not many of those <coughs> batteries around now. But once we used to always have to check the fluid. Once we used to have a little hydrometer that we'd pump up the um, fluid to check the gravity of the battery to see, as you're not in your head, you've seen those, to see the condition of the battery, but we don't have that luxury to do that now. So that's what I was talking about. So when the battery is flat, that float falls down. When the battery has got a good charge, the float goes up. And we used to see each cell, and sometimes we find one, one would be down, but the rest would be up. And we know then that cell had collapsed. But as I say, we can't do that now. Talking about voltage drop, okay? We want to make sure if we're checking a circuit, we start with the battery. We want to make sure the terminal at the ground or well, the negative terminal to the ground doesn't have a voltage drop. We want to make sure the positive side, say to the starter motor, 
But that doesn't have a voltage drop. Who in my class um, before have done voltage drops? You've done uh, maybe a few of you. Well, I'm talking about voltage drops. I've been meaning to ask you, Shushan, how did you go with your computer? Oh, on the car. On the car, with your problem. I haven't done anything yet. All right, what, when we go to the um, uh, workshop, we'll have a look at it, okay? We'll do a voltage drop test. I want to teach you guys and drum into you guys how to do voltage drop tests. If I put my, I've got my um, drop meter here. I brought it along today. Easy. I love silicon leads. I will get tangled up. Okay. If I'm, who's used to using a voltmeter? Who's not used to using a voltmeter? A few of you? Okay, or a multimeter in this case. So, I've got all these plugs. How do I know which ones to plug that into? How do I know? Color. Color, all right. Color, all right, so black. black, I can put black down. I'm pretty good about that. But now I've got three reds. Which one now? Depends on what you're going what to I'm going use. To do. All right, I want to check voltage. So which one am I going to put it on? There's a sign there. Here. Yeah. E, ohms. All right. What happens if I put it into this one? Ups. And I put it onto a volt reading. You yeah. know what will happen? The wrong reading. I will blow the internal fuse. Yeah. In this. Internal fuse. Oh, okay, oh, that's oh, why oh. I want to drum that into you. Make sure you're aware of that. If I put in there, I'm checking, I'm going to be checking the amp draw. If I'm checking the amp draw, okay, how am I going to put this in? Uh, am I going to put my terminals parallel or in series? Series. Series, you know, because you've been in my class before. So that's in series. <laughs> when I put it here, that's in parallel. We're going to be checking parallel. What we're going to do... I used to have a battery, I haven't got one now. You can check the outlet. Where's my other one? Okay. So what I'll do, I'll see how charged up Joseph is. Yeah, <laughs> Joseph, you've got a PC, I'm just gonna give you a second PC. <laughs> So, <laughs> so what what I'll do is I'll set, there, there's there's two lines and there's a wavy line. The wavy line is for AC. Okay. Yes. The two lines, there's a, a straight line, a dotted line, is for DC. So I'll be setting my multimeter because my multimeter, is, as the name says, it does multiple things. So we're testing now voltage. So now I'm going to my battery first. I've gone from positive to negative, and I see I've got 12.6 volts. I'm happy with that, okay? But my car's a bit slow starting up, and I've got to do some checks. So the next thing I'm going to do, let me show my battery here. I'm going to go from my positive battery. Well, actually, I'll go to my ground first, my ground there. And I'm going to go to maybe the engine block, somewhere, a nice clean spot on the engine block. What am I going to see on my voltmeter, you know? What will I see on my voltmeter? Zero. Pretty much zero. But I want to see what the voltage drop is. So I'm going to ask you, Abby, to start the car or crank the engine over. Mm. Once I do that, mm. what happens? Apart from the engine cranking, what happens to the battery? I start no, to get current yeah. flow. I get current flow. Yeah. It is so important to have current flow to check for a voltage drop. Mm. The so what I will be doing is, I've got Negative battery, engine block. Yeah. We're cranking the engine. I'm going to be looking at my gauge and I'm guaranteed I'm going to see a small amount of voltage. Yeah. What a voltmeter does, it reads the difference between two points. Same number. Okay? Oh, I... We say it reads voltage, but it reads differences in voltage. Oh. Differences. The potential difference between two points. So if I wind over the engine, and I can see that I've got maybe, say, two milliamps, or, yeah, two milliamps of voltage drop. I'm happy with that. But if I saw I had five milliamps of um, voltage drop or one one voltage drop, one one volt of voltage drop, I'm not happy with that. So that's how I do a voltage um, drop test. I must have current flowing to be done. Okay, the current doesn't flow. 
it won't read anything. But once it current flows, it does. And we'll prove that one day in the workshop, okay? We'll do that and we'll prove it. And we do the same on the positive side. So if we're going to do things like that to check that we don't have any voltage or excessive voltage drop. There's always voltage drop, always. Because we're lighting up a circuit, we've got cables that have a certain amount, copper cables have a certain amount of resistance. So there is a certain amount of resistance, so there's a certain amount of voltage drop. The higher the resistance, the higher the voltage drop. So if we've got a loose battery terminal, okay, we haven't got a tight fit there, we've got air in there, there's resistance in that air. So we will see a voltage drop if we have a loose battery terminal. We hope to anyhow. I've been proven wrong sometimes where we haven't picked up on that, but if we loosen enough, we generally get it to show a voltage drop. All right, so this is what all this is about, doing voltage drop. See how that light bulb's on? Yeah. If that wasn't on, we couldn't do a voltage drop there, so. okay? All right. So again, we've got different levels of this uh, hydrometer meter. Sorry? Is, is it on now? No, no, don't say. What do you want to do? switch it on. Thank you. So, so, depending on this flow is, is to how good the battery is, and there's a scale that we use. I don't know why I'm teaching you this, because you don't need to know this, because we don't have batteries that we do that now. Maybe I'm wrong. But what we do have now, we have, in, oh, here we have impedance test, electronic test that we test batteries with. Who's seen those? Huh? Who's seen these? Oh, yes, we have seen it. Yeah, everyone seen those? Yeah. No, I didn't. Oh, we sure, we sure. I haven't seen it. Sorry? We sure haven't seen it. See it now. See it now. Oh, Vishwa, yeah, I know. That's all right. I thought I had the smart ones in my class. Vishwa, you can't know what I mean. But no. So. When we're at the workshop um, next, remind me. Oh, we will, because we will be there to do our practical. Yes. We will test some batteries, okay? But um, I've also got a tester, which is called a load tester, and it's in, the, in that room there. I can get it out late and show you. But there's different ways of testing <coughs> certain batteries. But with a load tester, I'm actually drawing load off the battery. I'm actually cranking up a resistance in that battery and sticking both terminals, joining it, in series to the load tester and I'm putting a load on there to see how well the uh, battery performs mm -hmm. right. I can do that on a, a lead acid battery but I can't do that on say an AGM battery or wreck the AGM battery so we have to be careful when we use the right right testing tools okay. Yeah. But this is a safe tool and, and most of those tools can be set to AGM batteries to test okay most of the and what it does is it puts a very small impeding pipe current flows through the battery and it's looking at the resistance in that battery. And if the resistance in that battery is within reason, there's no voltage drops, in other words, then it passes the battery. But if it's starting to get resistance in there, there are, that indicates voltage drop in the cells, therefore the battery's on its way out. I sold a lot of batteries through one of those testers. Very good. Very good for selling batteries. Very good to helping customers. One day a customer came in and we told her in her service, you need a new battery. And the ladies didn't acknowledge that she wanted that done, so she took <coughs> the car away. It lasted another six to 12 months and came back, and we tested the battery again. I told her again, it needs a new battery. And she ignored it. She went, she went away, and less than a week, she broke down on the side of the road. We got this abusive phone call from her husband because we just serviced the car and the battery collapsed out. How could we have done a good job? She didn't tell the husband the battery was on its way out, nor did she tell him the first time. And once we told the husband, you know, the truth, and we had records of it, he was eating humble pie then, wasn't he? And his wife, I think they had an argument that night. I don't know how that went. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. He was... <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we need to be checking batteries, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is a low-test battery tester, okay? <laughs> So remind me after the smoke, after lunch, we'll see how long yet. Ask me after lunch to show you our load test if you like, but that's what they look like. And um, it's called a high rate discharge testing. 
This type of testing can strain the battery, can overheat the internal plates. The test is not suitable for AGM, gel, or lithium batteries. The battery tester is tested under high current. So it puts high current onto that battery to test it, to see how good the battery is. It's a good test, a really good test. Okay. Could you test the battery with that one? With the terminals of the car installed on the battery? Yes. Yeah. It won't damage anything. No. Make sure the keys are off, the ignition off. If we had the ignition on, we might not be so lucky. Okay. okay. I talked to you before about checking the voltage in the battery, right? To get an indication of how good the battery is. So, if we see 12.6 or more, I'm happy. I'm about 90% sure that the battery's okay, but it's a bit doubtful if it's 12.5, and so we go down the scale. If we get down to, um, well, I think even this, there's a 20% chance that battery's failed, I'd be a bit concerned from there onwards. What's that with the use of multi-tester? I beg your pardon? With the use of multi-tester, it's already? Yeah, the yeah, just about me to test the battery voltage, okay? Certainly, if we get down here, we're in big trouble. So, battery drain, okay, so every car, yes. what's that? Okay, you know that we're taking the photo of Oh, sure. <laughs> 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 yes, you should be able to access this through your, your um, accelerator. Yes, through your, but I tried to do it with um, Danish and I couldn't work out how to do it, so we'll come back to that. All right, we're ready to move on. Move to the move to the. So, every vehicle, there's a certain amount of voltage drain that comes from the um, keep alive um, things going on in the car for keep alive your station programs, keep alive. Um, alarm. Sorry. Alarm. Alarm. What's an alarm? Uh, alarm. <laughs> alarm. Alarm. Security system. Sorry, security. <laughs> So yeah, but there's a set, there's a certain amount of drain on the battery just for those things that are meant to be on. But most things go to sleep. The computers will stay awake for a little bit, then they go to what we call go to sleep. Because we don't want a heavy drain on the battery, otherwise we come in the next morning and won't start. <coughs> Occasionally, something goes wrong and something stays on and the battery drains, and that does happen. It's called a parasitic um, voltage drain, okay? Parasitic voltage drain is just that excessive current's been flowing, but it shouldn't be flowing, okay? We need to be careful. Sometimes a battery can actually have a short inside and it'll drain because it's a faulty battery we can get caught like that as well so yeah but we need to test things um, and uh, we test things by using we use our amp meter this time we've got to drain the battery i'm going to want to put that onto my amps i'm going to disconnect the battery terminal and run this into series and i'm going to see what the amps is and if i've got maybe 25 milliamps i'm happy that's okay but if I've got maybe, um, I don't know, um, 100 milliamps, I'm worried, or 80, even 80 milliamps, I'm, I'm so worried. worried. Yeah, yes. there's a there's a drain somewhere yes. that shouldn't be there. But I could have 800 milliamps when the computers are still alive. So you do have to wait for everything to shut down. So you might have to wait half an hour after yes. you turn the car off before you do that test. Yes. Okay. okay. Okay, when we're charging the battery, okay, we always use a good Australian approved battery charger, not one from Super Cheap. What did I say that? <laughs> but no, we, we want to be using a good quality battery charger, okay, and uh, not all chargers suit all batteries. 
Okay, particularly now we're talking AGM batteries. Certainly, lithium type batteries are going to use a different set of uh, means of charging. Okay, you have to always think about PPE. Uh, if charging the vehicle, the batteries should be isolated and disconnected. Do you been here long enough? To, you'll know I don't like disconnecting batteries. So if I do disconnect the battery, and I may have to, and I do have to. I'm going to make sure I've got some sort of backup, so the battery's got, so the, sorry, the circuits have a little bit of um, memory left in them by having some voltage going into the uh, place of where the battery comes out. I don't want to have to reprogram um, everything, because when we lose the programming of, say, the fuel, com the, um, fuel trims, we, we have to then re-initiate um, things, like even the door windows, when they go up and down, they have child safety mechanisms that you, if you're a child or someone's arms in the road or something's blocking the window going up, it will stop and go back down again. Sometimes it messes with that when we disconnect the battery. We lose all our radio stations. We lose a whole lot of memory stuff. The transmission has a memory in the transmission <coughs> to, to actually um, understand the driver's habits and therefore it changes the transmission in a much more appropriate mm. way for that driver. Whereas uh, if we lose all that, it becomes much different and the driver or the customer will feel those differences and they might not be happy. So I try to keep power onto the system and use a memory saver, right? You can buy memory savers, sometimes you put them in the mm. cigarette lighter um, but you, or even clip them to the battery terminals. But you need to keep power to the, if possible. All the clocks and everything, you lose all the time. Yeah, when you're changing yeah. battery, mm. right? So let's not disconnect the battery without doing some means of supplying uh, an auxiliary power to that um, car, okay? Um, talks about covering the vents, the vents with a damp cloth. I haven't done that, but I can understand where it's coming from. You've got all the, if it's been overcharged, you've got all that um, hydrogen coming out. It's a fire hazard or an explosion hazard, so that's what they're talking about. Um, Observe the correct polarity. How many times has someone put the battery on and the terminals the wrong way? And what does that do? I have that exception. A spark. <laughs> what happened? Uh, what car? What's that? Feels You've got to go in the five angle. You definitely got to go in the five angle. Sorry. <laughs> so what happened? What happened? Fuse, 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 fuse. Blown fuse, right? Is that all that happened? Sorry? Is that all that happened? So radio lucky, yeah, and the radio piece. You want to count your lucky stars because you could have owned a computer. Yes. Yeah. You're very lucky. Well, and yeah. Those fuses are the best thing that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> Those fuses blow. What computer? A vehicle has about 20 the plus computers, onboard computers. Uh, on the, uh, yeah, you don't want to blow any of those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Costs lots of money. But yeah. The best scenario is a fusible link will blow, and often yeah. that happens, and you're lucky. Yeah. And that's what they're there for. But yeah, some people are less lucky than you. But uh, so if we put a small battery it's 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 instead of the required one, yes. will the fuse still blow? Or? What sort of car do you have? Camry. What, what year? 2003. I remember your car. Yeah. <laughs> Not on the camera. Yeah. <laughs> that's why. Uh, so like the fuse won't blow up uh, no, from, no, from that small no, battery? No, no, no. no. Oh, really? What if it is going to be damaged? Yeah. Obviously, no, the battery is going to be damaged. Yeah. 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 If you put a smaller battery yeah. in an older car, yeah. it's just right yeah. last yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if you put a higher... Yeah. If you've got a lot of demand yeah. for uh, different uh, accessories yeah. on the car, yeah. electronics, yeah. you might start yeah. to find yeah. that battery yeah. runs yeah. out really quickly yeah. and it could affect things voltage-wise. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, the older cars you get away with a lot more. In the newer cars... Guys, a newer car, you won't get away with putting a small battery in. Yes, sir. The older cars, you'll get a lot of grace, okay? Uh, good to have old cars. Good to have old cars. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, always have, make sure the key's set off if you're um, pu pulling a battery terminal off, okay? Or if you're charging a battery, okay? Don't have the key. Yeah. Always remove the negative battery terminal first. This one, yes. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. Negative terminal. Because you have ground, yeah, ground body the body. Ground. 
So you don't touch anywhere while opening the That too, that too. And also, you're less likely to have a spark jump when you pull off the negative. Mm -hmm. The positive you could do as you pull it off. It's got current flowing. It's going to, I mean, current flows on both sides, but for some reason the negative isn't quite as, um, I suppose, it's a little bit safer. Yeah. Um, when we put the battery back in, yes. which one are we going to put on first? Positive, positive. Same thing. Same thing. Ah, same thing. Yeah, negative. 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 Oh, hang on. Well, no, the negative goes in. No, positive first, positive. sorry. Because yeah. the negative goes in last. Uh, my apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think I think I better go on the Friday group. <laughs> no, you had a good one. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's another um, battery charge. That's a good battery charger. Okay. I've got a little tiny battery charger, but um, this my battery charger I've got. It says it's a 30 amp um, charge battery charger, but the wires are very thin on it. There's no way it could cope, the, the thickness of those wires could cope with 30 amps, so, but this one it could easily, and it's got, you can do a high charge or a low charge, you've got a gauge there, uh, it could be an amp meter, it could be a volt meter, most likely a volt meter, but some will have both amp and volt meters on them, and uh, I would recommend that in a workshop sense to get a decent battery charger, okay, and one that um, you can do a high charge or a low charge. If I'm going to do a high charge, because the battery needs to be charged up really quickly, it's really dead. How long will I put it on a fast charge for? Or how long would you think would be the safe? Well, can I do it? Can I put it on a fast charge? I've got a lead acid battery and it's dead flat. No, no, no. no. Not true, I can. You can, but, 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 but you're going to miss this if you go now. But if I, <laughs> But if I put if I put that battery on charge for a um, a, a, a too long a period of time, yes, it's going to get too hot, and it's not going to be good for those battery um, plates because they get hot, they bulk or they get um, distorted because of the heat. Yeah. So if I put it up no more than thirty minutes, I should be okay. Then I want to turn it right down. Yeah, so a lot of battery chargers can be quite smart, and they will actually adjust and work automatically. Yes, sir. Set automatically. So that's probably a safer way. But if I'm doing it manually, no more than 30 minutes. And then I put it down to a slow charge. I want to boost it up because it's dead. And I've probably pre prematurely um, seen the life, some life taken out of that battery by having it go dead flat like that. But hopefully it'll have a bit more life, okay? All right. That might be a question in your assessment. Remember that, jot that down in your mind or your notes. Okay. All right. We're not replaced the battery. Um, we're putting our safety glasses on, aren't we? And we're putting our gloves on. What sort of gloves are we going to put on? We're going to put some, um, some of those, um, those little rubber Not gloves, gloves, those ones we use in the packet, what they call them, um, nitro gloves. Are we going to put our nitro gloves on? Are we? Yeah. What happens if I got some acid on my nitro glove? What would happen? It would melt them. Uh, Sorry? It would melt the gloves. It would. There's a good friend of uh, my brother's who um, was cleaning a driveway, cement driveway, and was using some sort of acid to clean the driveway. He burnt both hands to the point that he had to go to the hospital. He was bandaged up, couldn't drive. He was an invalid for nearly, nearly 12 months because he got acid burn. It was horrible. Um, so, a dangerous way to learn a lesson like that. But yeah, make sure you put acid resistant gloves on. Mm -hmm. okay. Whether you do or not, I've told you the right way to do it. Okay? <laughs> put them on. Uh, what else? Um, select the correct battery. <coughs> I've talked about that already. Uh, just make sure the terminals are the right way, the right, you know, if the battery is close to your stomach, looking at the battery and the positive and negative, positives on this side. Check the other battery, the new one. Make sure it's the right way. Nothing more frustrating than the battery, clamping it down. Oops, it's the wrong battery, and I've got to pull it out again, okay? So just check those things, visual checks at the same time. Uh, when you've installed it, pick the positive terminal first. That's what I said, didn't I? I didn't, did I? <laughs> positive first, and then the negative. And uh, fit the, secure the battery. Clear fault codes. There could be fault codes from a bad battery. A, fault, a battery, often when you have a low voltage in a battery system in the computer car, 
Often you get a lot of what's called U codes. What's U codes stand for? Some of you will know. Connection. Sorry? Communication. Communication, communication yeah. codes, okay? Because there hasn't been enough voltage, the communication's been distorted, and you get these U codes through the uh, system. <coughs> so we want to clear any codes. That are there. there could be even other body control codes, all sorts of codes to clear them. And um, uh, recalibrate. What do I mean by recalibrate the battery? Okay, it says here, recalibrate the battery systems, the B battery monitoring systems if required. Some most, cars. Sorry? Some cars have it. Yeah. Most late model cars, but maybe not all, you need to recalibrate. We need a scan tool to do that. We need to tell the car we have a new battery fitted. Okay? We, I had an Audi once. We replaced the battery, a late model Audi, and the battery, to recalibrate that battery, we have to get the code that's off the um, top of the battery, right? And we put that code into the computer to say it's a new battery. And that computer then knows it's a new battery and does its um, um, uh, adaptive um, changes to make that battery um, charge properly. Because we have things called smart alternators. Smart alternators are controlled by the computer. So the computer needs to know it's got a new battery. When a battery gets older, it becomes much more resistance in that battery. And so the computer adjusts things to suit the old battery. If we put a new battery, and it's an AGM battery, which it probably is, we put an AGM battery in, and we start overcharging that because the computer has remembered beforehand that it needed to put more current and more voltage in because the battery had more resistance. It starts doing that to the new battery, which it will do. What happens? We put too much charge, we overcharge our battery, Therefore, we prematurely start to damage that battery for the word go. So that's why we have to do the uh, recalibration. So this car, I had this Audi, the new battery was aftermarket and it did not have a code on it. So I wrote the battery company up and they said, don't worry about it. But I knew I had to worry about it. I knew because I know, I know, I learned, I kept myself um, knowledgeable because I want to understand new technology and I knew. And they didn't know what they're talking about. So I rang up my mate in Sydney, he's pretty smart with European cars, and I talked to him. He said, Morris, just put the old code back in, at least then the computer knows that uh, it's a new battery, and, and at least it won't overcharge the battery. So that's what I did. But I stopped buying back my batteries from that company after that, because I thought if they don't keep up with the technology, I'm going to go to someone who does. And so I did change my battery company just over there, because I thought, yeah, they should have known that. They're a battery specialist, aren't they? They should know. But I'm telling you guys so you don't get caught. Okay, not every scan tool, if you buy a cheap scan tool, may be able to do what I'm just saying. It might not be. Often, I had two or three scan tools in my shop, actually I had five or six to be honest, but I had these scan tools because if one didn't do what I wanted, I could go to the next one until I found the tool that would do it. Okay, a factory scan tool is by far the best, but we can't have outlay a, a factory scan tool for every make of car that there is, so we generally have to use aftermarket scan tools. Um, but anyhow. Alright. Any questions? No. You're tired. <laughs> How about standing up? Stand up. Come on. Stand up. Stretch. While you're setting up, I'll keep talking, keep going. Um, a lot of stop-start cars are saying it's particularly important to actually um, do the calibration of those as well, okay? But pretty much everything that's written there, I've already talked to you about. Um, some cars have a battery sensor, um, sensor on them. So everything's controlled by the computer, okay? So the computer needs to know when we do something like change a battery. Okay, I'm not going to read all that, that's too much writing for me, I'd get bored if I had to read that, I'd bore you too. But all I'm saying to us really, step one, we've got a flat battery, okay? Yeah. So we're going to connect the good battery to the flat battery red to red, mm, okay? Parallel. Step two, we're going to hop first off to the um, ground on the good battery, but we're not going to go to the negative terminal, we're going to go to the engine block. Why would we do that? 
when we use a jump start? For the voltage. That's slightly right, but not really the answer I want. So the well, alternator will... No. What was the question? Why are we... Our step two is to hook up the battery to the good battery on the ground, and then the third step is to hook it to the engine block, not the well, not to the battery, standard. not to the battery. So it wouldn't uh, absorb the of the good battery oh. flat. What we don't want is a risk of any sparkle in that battery if there's any vapors or fumes around. So we lessen the risk by going to the engine block. So we're away when we hook that up because current will start to flow. Because this battery is so flat that there's a potential difference between between there and there. If we go from there to there, that potential distance, I'm uh, sorry, potential uh, difference will spark when we hook it up there because the battery's flat and the current will start flowing. So if we put it there and we're going to spark in the engine block, we're further away from the battery for that to spark. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the only reason. Okay. The safety reason. And, and that, the, all that writing is telling you what I just told you. We probably have to start the car, if we're using a car, a good diamond car, we'd start the engine up, make sure everything's turned off before we put the jumper leads on. When we start the car with a dead battery, are we just going to pull the leads off then? No one's going to answer me, are they? Yeah. So you don't know the answer, do you? You what, should what? just pull it up. You should just pull it off. You're a gay man. Anyone else? What was the question? If we just started the car right, we just started the car with a dead battery, yeah. are we just going to pull the lead straight off now that we've got the car running? You should know, Abby, you an auto electrical mind. Yes, pull it off. Anyone else? Anyone else? You're going to tell me. Me? Yes. What's the question again, sir? <laughs> I just you're, came supposed in now. To, you're supposed to be smart. No, no, I just, I just came in now. Why? I have to stay in class. Okay, okay. All right, I just started a dead flat battery. Right. I've got a car running that's right. got a good battery, right? Right. And I've got all my jumper leads hooked up correctly. Right. And now I've started the car that's got a dead battery, right? right. Mm. Now it's running. Am I just going to rip everything off now and take the jumper leads off? Yeah, we can do that. Sorry? We can do that. Let it charge. Ah, yes, we're not going to do it until we put a bit of charge into that battery. We're going to let it run off. No, 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 no,